Welcome to the Idocracy Show on today's episode. What is a colophone? Is it something you eat? No, no, it's it's a colophone. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, I'm David Landin. And I'm J.D. Melville. And welcome to the Adhocracy Show, your weekly source for advertising, marketing, art, and design. That's where we geek out. This is where we have fun, you know? And what is geekier than a colophone? I don't know. (laughs) Today we're actually going to be talking about the colophone. Have you ever heard of it? No. No. Is it a a phone that you can hear in color? I hope so. Is it uh, Cousin to the Broccoli? Or cauliflower. I probably no. no. That wouldn't really have to do with our brand very much. <laughs> is it a new punk band taking the underground by storm? No. It, well, <laughs> maybe. We're, we're not really in on the underground, so it might be. It's true. Well, if you haven't heard of it before, we're not surprised. It's not as popular as it once was, and it's uh, become something completely and entirely different today. But it's definitely worth a little bit of an attention. So... A colophone is a publishing or printing term that comes from the Greek word meaning summit or finishing touch. They're typically located at the end of a book, scroll, or tablet and would contain information such as where it was published, who published it, when it was published, the editor and the, per- and the proofreader, and other times they could include a picture or emblem. Yeah, um, and you know they sometimes put you know re- repeated catchphrases and stuff. I mean, it was it was kind of a, a way of indexing some of these things ah. because like you would be kind of scrolling through and you'd be able to look at the colophon and know um, what that tablet or scroll or whatever is about. Um, today, the information is usually on the title page at the front of the book, um, known as the imprint. So, it'll kind of show you know what what. Um, what the press name is, the type styles, paper used, substrates, um, edition number, how it was printed, and even sometimes a website. I'm always just excited because I'm like, it's a page I don't have to read. (laughs) I read a page today. You are just skipping over history, David Landine. History. Well, I didn't know what it was before. (laughs) But this little little piece of information actually has a very long history. In fact, some parts um, of the Bible in Genesis and Numbers... Um, are thought to be sec- uh, sections of this nature. So there's not like an exact date of when colophones started being used. Um, some of the earlier beginnings were on, on these tablets and scrolls. Um, colophones included information on them that made them easier to sort. It's kind of like metadata in their oh, day, okay. right? Okay, okay. It was, it was kind of like their meta- metadata or being able to search with Spotlight or whatever you're... <laughs> So in Chinese hand scrolls and, the, uh, and art, the colophone is a bit more diverse and interesting. Yeah. The colophone would be a section before and after or after a painting or a separate piece of parchment or silk. On this separate piece, um, it could be written by logi- biographical, bi- biographical, biologi- <laughs> no, biographical information about the artist. It'd be really funny if it was biological information about the artist. This is their DNA sequence. <laughs> you could learn a lot more about that artist. Um, biographical information about the artist or author, comment from the from collectors, viewers, friends of the artist, praise of the work, sketches of the artist, working commentary on the previous comments, um, context up to the painting and its history, interpretations, feelings, and how art impacted you. Which sounds, you know, this may sound familiar to you. And I would imagine there are probably also uh, hate comments in there and trolls. You had those colophone trolls. (laughs) Colophone trolls? Yeah. (laughs) They would go on and and they would, this is so dumb. Like, why would anybody even read this? I want to be a colophone troll. (laughs) So it it, it very much was like a comment section on a website today. And uh, finally, people's seals or stamps would be upon to show ownership and pride in that ownership and even someone who viewed it or was impacted by it. So, yeah, like it was, it was the common section. Yeah, some of the, li- the little red stamps that you see on art and stuff, that's, that's what those are. Do they look like a thumbs up sometimes? <laughs> we should do a red one. <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, sometimes the information in a colophone is so straightforward and unembellished. Like it's just, this is what it is and this is where it is. Other also times, known as boring. Boring. <laughs> yeah, other times they're quirky and fun place to add fun information. Uh, it could be perhaps a bit of music and words. Some people, you know, like when monks were scribing stuff, they could, you know, add chants, Gregorian chants to it and things like that. 
Um, and in middle, medieval days, uh, the colophon was actually a place where the scribes sort of had freedom. They could write whatever they wanted in a colophon. Um, so who? So would would including like the the like the scribe would be the one that writes the colophon or mm-hmm. yeah. So because books back then like they were like hand right. So you would you were supposed to hand hand letter and write everything translate like perfectly right. Like you had to write it perfectly, but in the colophon, it was like, oh, okay, I've got some, I got to write, you know, information about the book, but what, I can where it was my... translated. They added things like book curses, which <laughs> there were book curses. Okay. Um, they would add these curses to anyone that would ruin, deface, or steal a book. Um, one of the ry- rhyming scribes wrote this, steal not this book, my honest friend, for fear the gallows should be your end. And when the Lord will, when you die, the Lord will say, "And where's the book you stole away?" So all those people on Facebook, they're like, you know, share this and you'll get good yeah, luck. Yeah, and yeah, keep that's scrolling in. It's the modern day colophon book curse. <laughs> that's the post curse. It's the post curse. <laughs> um, as printing became more common after the printing press and the Renaissance came around, the text began becoming more artistic. Uh, this is where images or icons began being used and would include information like dates, addresses, and print owners. In the 15th century, some of the marks would include alchemy symbols related to the metals that were used to make the type, which was typically an- antimony mm-hmm. and tin. Yeah, uh, It became so popular that it became its own mark known as the printer's mark. Yeah, and we see those printer marks today. I mean, Random House, you have... Um penguin books you i mean you have their their own printer's mark there that that printers use these days and it's a completely separate thing now yeah uh colophones continued to be um set in new and different shapes you know the the text would actually be kind of aligned differently and weird um it would begin to include uh praises of the books and its merits and around 1480 uh, moved to a blank page that would be included in the beginning of the book, which was actually the humble beginnings of the title page. Now, before you mourn our dear beloved friend, the colophon, mm-hmm. it's found itself, or a form of itself, on websites. These colophones will include uh, HTML, CSS, or usability standards, compliance information, and links to website validation tests. So now you know what it is, what it does, and its various uses. The colophon definitely fathered different things that are very common to books our day. So I think before we end this episode, I I feel like this was a very geeky episode. It was. It was super geeky. And we haven't really like seen JD's inner geek come out. <laughs> like, why should we care? Well, I think I think for one, uh, the printer's mark and the title page. Like those are things that are so common today. Like if it's not in a book. You look for it, right? It's kind of like, oh, well, I mean, there's books that I've, I've found that I'm looking for um, the imprint, the information of when it was printed, what the, the date it was. Um, and that stuff has history. It's not just someone, you know, it, it's not a modern day invention with books. It, it goes way back in the day. And some of these things are super cool. I mean, looking at some of the examples of hand-lettered colophones and what the scribes did with these book curses, super cool. Um, and then basically what would be a logo for print house is these print, uh, um, printers marks, uh, that kind of stuff is cool. So one of the other things that, that really gets cool, um, there are people who still use these today, um, and they will get very detailed on, you know, this is 60 pound cover. This is this font set in six, six point type, um, with this. And I, I, it, it's something that can be used. That's really interesting and really cool. And so if you're writing a book, you know, consider using a colophon because it's uh, it's something different. It's something new. It's something that uh, you can add, you know, something that ties to the next book you're writing. It's like, it's like uber retro. Yeah. Like super, super retro. Like this is like, like middle, <laughs> mi- medieval <laughs> retro. Medieval retro. Yeah. We go <laughs> way back. Well, there's a, there's historic value in these colophons. Mm-hmm. You find, you find a old, old book and it's important that they put these Cool phones there because you it has some really like it, like information like a lot of information. I, I would imagine that the the people who work on like Antiques Roadshow like 
they are really glad that the colophone is there. Let me tell you about this little piece of information right here. This is called the colophone. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. a there's a book guy out there that there does is. that. And and he just found this episode and is just freaking out that somebody else cares about the colophone besides him. <laughs> well, and I also I'm I'm also really surprised um, as we were researching this um, about like the the clay tablets and how they had these sections at the bottom um, that sort of made them ca- like you could categorize these things. You could look through them. You could like it, it's genius mm-hmm. and it you know it definitely gives a lot of light to people back in the day. Um, that they weren't just these simpletons. Like they had really diverse thought. They had really interesting ways of doing some of these things. Super cool. So that's the colophone. Yay, colophones! Not a telephone that you can see in color, that you can hear in color. No. That's also known as face. So, what uh, what questions do you have about it? What things did you learn? What things have we missed about the colophone? Because... Have Have you ever seen a colophone before? Ooh. Be- besides the examples that we showed today. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, let, let us know in the comments below. Um, thank you for liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing to uh, this video and this channel. Yeah, if you liked what you saw, make sure you click the subscribe button. That will let you know when we have new videos. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram where we post other stuff. And so uh, you should check that out. Yeah, and to uh, continue your week with more video and things to look at and be interested in, here is a video for your Wednesday. Today we're talking about colophons and limitations and things like that, which are generally pretty straightforward sorts of things, but there are also some place where there's a bit of a pitfall too.